Okay, so with a um, somewhat rocky start, hey everyone, I'm Alex from the Korolev Crater uh, SAR team, um, here to show you our ideas. So, uh, slide? Slide, slide, yep. So, um, much as going into orbit requires um, considerably more than just being high up off the ground, building a sustainable settlement requires considerably more than simply putting people on Mars. So we've built somewhat of a hierarchy of needs here, where down the bottom we have uh, life support, um, which, as you'd all know, you need air to breathe, you need water to drink. But just as important, going up this pyramid, you have social cohesion, as people need to work together. You have economic viability, as you need to produce both domestic goods and services, as well as um, you need to be able to uh, afford the imports that you need in order to sustain your society. And then at the top, you need uh, a bright future, meaningful lives to give people something to believe in. They need a dream. So going back down, a uh, slide, yep. So going back down to the life support systems, um, the core concept here is that you need to create large quantities of power because with that power, you can go and create um, large amounts of water, air and food along with the materials you need to go and grow and continue to, to sustain your base. But, the, um, but something that you need to keep in mind here is the waste generated. Industrial processes can be toxic and you need to make sure not to poison yourself. Slide. So why are we, so given that in mind, why did we choose Korolev Crater? So as we mentioned in the previous slide, you need to produce very large quantities of power. And so as um, the, the primary issue with generating large quantities of power isn't actually generating the heat itself. The primary issue is actually having a heat sink for that waste heat. Unfortunately, Mars doesn't have much in the way of rivers or lakes or oceans, but what it does have is about 2000 cubic kilometers of ice in a very convenient location. So what we're doing is using that as our final uh, heat reject spot. And then as we reject heat to it, we gain access to fresh water as it goes through and melts. And then as we take that water out to use it for industrial and other purposes, we gain access to living space, which has radiation shielding because it's sitting under the ice. And this is a, a cold climate because it is above the Martian Arctic Circle, but given the low um, surface pressure of Mars, it's actually quite reasonable there. And what's also important is that it is a natural cold trap. So as you cross that crater rim, on the one side, you've got ice. On the other side, you've got access to regolith with no surface ice, making it um, very useful for surface mining slide. So going back to the, that core consideration of power. So we're using a 12 gigawatt thermal reactor. That is, it's producing 12 gigawatts of heat. Um, we're using a fast spectrum, which allows us to uh, burn up uh, uranium-238. Um, and we're using a very interesting design here of disposable molten salt fuel pins that again lets us burn considerably more of the fuel than you otherwise would, with the downside being that that fuel salt is corrosive. Um, and so we deal with that by having the fuel pins be disposable. And then we use a more standard cooling salt that then allows the reactor to be made using much more straightforward metallurgy. So once we've created that heat, we need to turn that into electricity. And so we use one to three gigawatts of 3D printed low pressure turbines, um, along with four gigawatts from a cryo battery, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, we also have what's known as a thermalized region. So we have fast neutrons in the core that are not being slowed down. Those then get slowed down at the edges for neutron capture, um, primarily for things like uh, uranium, but also for things like cobalt, which is useful industrially. And as we're a fast spectrum reactor, we have a whole host of very useful products in that spent nuclear fuel that we can later reprocess. So things like americium 242M1 for microscale nuclear reactors as its critical mass is only 10 kilograms, uh, plutonium 238 for RTGs for space probes and the like, along with normal plutonium for killer power class uh, modular reactors, as well as nuclear rocket fuel, both for current Nova class ships, along with future pulsed fission fusion designs, which are currently in development. Uh, and then once we've uh, generated that, we are storing any excess because this reactor has a capacity factor of nearly one. So it should be running essentially all the time. 
So we store it in the form of liquid nitrogen. And this also doubles up as something to keep our cryostore cold because we need something to keep our oxygen liquid and our methane happy. And so when we want to use that uh, back for energy, we take that liquid nitrogen, heat it up slightly, and then that then becomes um, high pressure nitrogen gas, which can then run our, um, runs through turbines, produces electricity. And that's distributed, sorry, that is distributed through a smart electrical slash thermal grid um, to match supply with demand uh, slide. So one of those major demands is water. So as we mentioned earlier on, we are getting water from the glacier. The glacier is full of water. Um, we're also going to be uh, pulling it out of the atmosphere as people are respiring it. Uh, most importantly, though, we are recycling it. So that's both biologically using microorganisms to break down complex proteins, but also using a process called TSSE. So TSSE is temperature swing solvent extraction. It uses an easy to produce organic solvent that absorbs differing amounts of water based on its temperature. So by heating it up using reactor waste heat and then chilling it using the glacier, we're able to pull water out of wastewater um, to the point of dryness, which is very useful. Uh, slide. Uh, next comes the atmosphere, which is, again, absolutely critical. So Mars is the red planet. And what makes it red is iron oxide. So we are, as part of our mining process, we are splitting that iron oxide into iron and oxygen. That oxygen is something we can breathe. We have fairly standard photosynthesis, along with a less standard zinc sulfur iodine thermocycle. So this uses the extreme heat from the reactor to go and split carbon dioxide and water into carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, monitoring this atmosphere is absolutely crucial. Um, specifically for overpressure situations, things like fires or leaks can very rapidly cause large amounts of pressure to build up inside what is essentially an airtight bubble. And so um, automatic venting is uh, absolutely essential. Uh, we use a cryogenic store to go and match pressure um, and ensure that uh, the various amounts of gases are correct. And we use biological scrubbers to get rid of things like volatile organic compounds. And then we recycle carbon dioxide, both through photosynthesis and for, through chemical scrubbers, uh, sending it off to industry uh, slide. So going back down to waste. So we're producing large amounts of uh, biomass waste. So that's being uh, digested biologically and recycled. Uh, chemical waste, particularly in terms of mining and the like, is incredibly important as a lot of it is in intensely toxic. Um, and uh, great care needs to be taken to keep it away from food production or your water supply. And so safeguards and monitoring are critical. We're also going to be producing nuclear waste. And so forming a geological waste repository with sufficient shielding um, is an absolute requirement. And finally, in terms of biological waste recycling, recycling phosphorus and sulfur are the major concerns as they're the hardest to come by. Uh, slide. So on to food. Uh, everyone needs to eat. So this is um, one of our more interesting types of um, food growing uh, apparatus. So rather than using, say, a 3D printed uh, greenhouse made out of plastics that you need to somehow produce and the like, we're using biologically derived oils and waxes to form what is essentially um, a tube around a tube of water. And so if you look at the graph on the right there, you can see how deep that coating needs to be to allow the water to sit at that temperature um, and then allow the growth of the various organisms. And so this both allows the growth of um, useful algae and the like, um, which can be eaten directly or through intermediates, or, but it can also allow for artificial ecosystems, including fish and the like. Uh, next slide. Um, this is slightly more out of the ordinary. So xenotrophs are things that eat strange things. So they eat things like ammonia, carbon monoxide, hydrogen gas directly. Very useful if you're sitting on Mars. Um, this in particular are methanotrophs. So they eat methane and methanol. Now, as you're a Mars colony, you're going to be mass producing methane by the literal ton um, for your rockets. You need incredible amounts to go and get to and from Earth. Um, and so by diverting a small portion of this, 
uh, from rocket fuel production into food production, you can go and quite easily feed large numbers of people, and it makes a very useful emergency food supply. This is currently used uh, already on Earth to feed animals using natural gas, and using the nuclear uh, food cycle option here, um, the energy in one kilogram of uranium produces approximately 850,000 person days of food. Uh, slide. So, um, to, as kind of a recap, you have raw materials. So you have the ice itself, uh, both water ice, as well as dry ice in the winter, which is very useful as a form of uh, bulk carbon dioxide. Um, and you take those materials, so the ice, the regolith on the outside of the crater, as well as the atmosphere, which contains uh, nitrogen, which is critical for life, along with argon, which makes a very useful uh, bulk gas, and you're turning them into bulk materials. You're turning it into iron, you're turning it into plastic, you're turning it into food. But at the moment, most of the food that I've, I've mentioned is not especially appealing. So what you do is use synthetic biology techniques to create, for example, artificial milk and cheese without needing cows, artificial egg whites without needing chickens. Um, you can also create various medicines, again, without needing the plants that they came from, um, such as opioids and the like. Um, and you can also create uh, special building materials, such as artificial spider silk, um, which you can modify to make um, advanced composite materials on Mars. And so as you are producing those um, bulk materials, both the common ones like iron, as well as the uncommon ones like phosphorus and sulfur, which are absolutely critical for life and must come from the regolith, um, and which our mining process will automatically extract, um, as well as thorium, which has been mapped around the crater, does exist, and by leaching it out of the minerals, you are securing your long-term energy independence. Um, and so, um, yeah, so as I was mentioning, the sulfur and phosphorus, they limit the size of our artificial um, ecosystem, um, and the use of artificial uh, biological techniques allow for a trade-off between both biological and industrial chemical processes. As an example, a Sabatier reactor is a very efficient way to convert um, hydrogen and carbon dioxide into methane, but I have yet to see a Sabatier reactor go and divide itself um, if left by itself for a few hours, whereas a tank full of methanogenic bacteria will quite happily um, scale to your heart's content even if they are less efficient. So these materials, both these bulk materials and these higher order materials um, are used to provide the consumables um, to go into factories to then produce the consumer goods and the export goods needed for the economy to function. And speaking of the economy, here's John Walker with the next stage in the development uh, slide. So Alex has done the hard work of detailing KCSAR's life support systems, and we turn now to KCSAR's social and economic design to consider how we can satisfy its higher order needs. In this section, I'll outline the structures of KCSAR's governance, the key policies of its government, and the viability of its external position. So this slide. Firstly, looking at governance. KCSAR is a special administrative region of the United States of America, which has a substantial degree of independence, similar to the relationship, for example, between China and Hong Kong. This offers it access to sovereign debt, military support, nuclear technology, and ITAR restricted materials. Authority is separated along the three traditional branches of power, the executive, legislature, and judiciary, as well as the fourth branch, the audit branch, which is responsible for overseeing the functions of the other three and preventing corruption. How then to elect officials and go about governing? KCSAR uses a delegative democracy in which each citizen has a right to vote on every governmental issue brought about by procedural legislation, as would occur in a direct democracy, but also offers the capacity for citizens to delegate their votes along thematic lines. For example, I might delegate my vote to Alex for all engineering issues because I know that he knows far more about them than I do. This approach approximates direct democracy while addressing its primary limitations, high time costs and limited knowledge of individuals on the full breadth of government operations. The voting system relies on cryptographic primitives, including homomorphic encryption and linkable ring signatures, allowing for anonymous secure voting. And it also makes use of robotic index voting, which enables individuals to delegate their vote based on simple if-then logic or more complex logic trees. We think that this approach does a good job of maximizing social welfare, government transparency, and individual agency, 
and has key psychological benefits as citizens have direct control of the systems that impact their lives, as well as means of redress. Slide. So then, what is the role of government in KCSAR? Broadly, we think it is responsible for one, responding to immediate existential threats, two, providing social planning and programs, three, sourcing revenue in a responsible way that wouldn't, for example, distort market outcomes, um, and finally, four, preventing the acquisition and misuse of market power. This is a substantial degree of government intervention, but we believe that the restrictions put on government behavior by the government structures I detailed, as well as the socially minded values of KCSAR's culture, ensure trust in government to maximize social welfare. Next slide. Looking firstly to immediate threats. The first threat is projected low fertility rates, which pose a risk for social collapse. To incentivize families to engage in child rearing, we provide a child allowance as part of our universal basic income plan, alongside easily adjustable economic levers, such as guardian allowances and carer leave. We also propose the usage of embryonic selection in which potential embryos are screened and ranked on their phenotypic fitness, as well as importation of gametes from Earth to sustain phenotypic diversity. Finally, we offer educational campaigns and workplace regulations to ensure family-friendly workspaces and encourage the development of a culture that would celebrate child rearing. The second three key threat is shortage in critical skills. KCSAR is crucially dependent on service providers, whether they are engineers, plumbers, or doctors. AI-based models are therefore used to predict colony demand across a broad set of skills and to match immigrants and local graduates to domestic needs. The final major threat is potential collapse of law and order which would trigger interruptions to core processes and require costly interventions to maintain order, such as perpetrator incarceration. KCSAR relies on the structure of its social planning to maximize welfare and minimize inequality, thereby reducing the likelihood of need-induced crime. The physical and psychological needs of citizens are also regularly monitored in their interactions with healthcare professionals, and the government uses this data, data to prioritize early intervention to limit hardship, prevent ghettoization and radicalization. Turning now to social planning, what kind of overarching, overarching socioeconomic structures would be put in place? KCSAR provides a universal basic income to all citizens. It's indexed against a basket of consumer goods that represents a comfortable standard of living. Wages continue to be paid by businesses in addition to that base income, offering additional access to luxury goods. This obviates the need for secondary transfer payments and their associated costs while maintaining market incentives for workforce participation. As human capital and workforce health are key factors in the operation of the Martian economy, healthcare and, kindergarten, uh, healthcare and kindergarten to university education are universally available and free. Both systems focus on maintaining client health as we recognize the pressures of colony life. KCSAR also has a sovereign wealth fund, which takes a proportion of citizens' income each year and reinvests it into public interest products. The funds grow year on year and enable many to self-fund their retirement, and a minimum retirement income is underwritten by the government. Slide. Looking now to the taxation mix, how is it structured? It's centered on a large, highly progressive income tax and includes taxes on capital to ensure redistribution from the most to the least well off. A substantive land tax is levied to encourage the most efficient usages of land and the development of regional specialization. And finally, as described earlier, there is a sovereign wealth fund levy. What then of industry regulation? On Mars, natural monopolies are expected to form around key industries from utilities to production of construction materials through the original design manufacturing model. This gives rise to a risk that monopolists will leverage their market share to maximize profit at the expense of social welfare. We propose that, that KCSAR issue monopoly licenses to trusted vendors in exchange for direct government oversight of recipient firms through things like board seats allocated to government officials and regular audits by the audit branch, holding them accountable to maximizing social welfare. Slide. Turning finally to KCSAR's external position, we acknowledge that the colony will continue to be reliant on some crucial imports in the medium term. I mentioned, for example, a reliance on imported gametes, but we expect that KCSAR will also rely on things like pharmaceuticals and productive material imports. Given this reliance, we believe that the viability of KCSAR's external position turns on one, the size and diversity of its export market, which will be used to pay for imports, two, transportation costs, which determine the ratio of exports to imports needed to maintain a neutral balance of goods and services, and three, the colony's debt servicing capacity, or its ability to meet debt repayment requirements. Slide. Firstly, Export market strength. We believe that KCSAR will have comparative advantage in the production of a range of products. For example, KCSAR's access to glacial environments offers it a cheap solution to cooling quantum machine learning facilities, such as used, those used by D-Wave. Five minutes until QA starts. Thank you. And thereby comparative advantage in the market for training machine learning algorithms, which is projected to be quite a large source of revenue into the future. 
KCSAR's, KCSAR's ability to leverage its advantage in this market and those of other things listed on this slide likely give it the capacity to pay off these imports into the foreseeable future, even if there are substantial sector specific variations in terms of trade due to the diversity of the portfolio of exports. Secondly, transportation costs. Rockets will form the basis for interplanetary trade. As actuarial models are yet poorly capable of predicting the life cycle value of rockets, enforcing high premiums, we support government intervention to provide reinsurance to the commercial bonds insurance market for leased rockets, allowing for the formation of collateralized debt obligations and re-rating of debt for sale to earthbound investors at a much smaller risk premium. Finally, debt servicing capacity. KCSAR's debt burden is primarily made up of mortgage-backed securities capping out at 736 billion and debt taken on by the sovereign wealth fund capping at about 120 billion. We think this debt mix is sufficiently well collateralized. We also think that KCSAR's productive capacity projected at around 28 billion per year is relatively large compared to the scale of the debt, indicating that it's a sustainable debt portfolio. I'll now hand over to Slim to address the development of a KCSAR culture, the colony aesthetic, and the future of the colony. Okay, so we've spoken about the uh, engineering systems and the overarching economic superstructures, but ultimately people need to be able to live and build meaningful lives and feel that they're going to have a bright future while preserving social cohesion. And the question is, how do we achieve that? In its totality, KCSAR's architectural aesthetic is based on parametric design, relying on 3D printed elements that produce unique and visually striking shapes. However, it also embraces, embraces Bauhaus design principles where form follows function, giving stylistic difference to individual structures based on the intended purpose. For example, industrial commercial domes feature stylistic elements of block-like brutalist architecture to reflect their role as the functional drivers of the economy. By contrast, government or administrative domes feature formal neoclassical elements as a reminder that the people and their government are the living heart of KCSAR. These aesthetic cues, we believe, breaks up the homogeneity of the domes and introduces a really great vibrance to the landscape. Now we'll move into what the architecture of a single dome uh, tower looks like. So at the surface uh, of, the, of the crater, we have a series of small pressure domes, which are interconnected together to provide a gateway to the Martian surface for the transport of goods without losing atmospheric pressure. These domes are then connected to an intricate network of roads and rail systems that en enable access to mines on the outer rim, as well as inlets and farms that sit adjacently. Beneath uh, the surface, we've got a vertical stack of subsurface domes. Each dome has a dimension of around 150 meters wide to 20 meters in height and can hold a capacity of around 2000 people. And we expect that we can fit around five domes stacked vertically on top of each other. Now, when we move inside an individual dome, given the extraordinary labor and resource scarcity that Alex and John have introduced, the successful operation of the colony requires the embrace of three central cultural tenets, valuing social, socially minded behaviors, celebrating close familial and communal relationships, and embracing innovative thinking. To support the development of this culture, we provide economic support for families, innovation and cultural grants, and employ what we call cultural nudges um, in, order, in the design of physical spaces. So for example, within each uh, residential dome, we've got five different floors. And as you can see from the slide, they really try to emphasize communal gatherings and artistic expressions. Due to the uh, limited time, I'm going to draw focus to the perhaps the two more novel parts, which is one, our cultural center and our underground beach. The cultural center sits at the epicenter of each dome, comprising of three concentric circles that celebrates innovation by showcasing original music, food, art, and accomplishments of local scientists, innovators, and business champions, whilst also allowing for activities such as hackathons and debates to occur within the inner circle. To our most exciting feature, by capitalizing the dome segment beneath the subglacial lake, where the pressure inside inside and outside the dome are equal at approximately 25 to 30 meters underwater minutes and where we have heat for q and a sorry five it's time for q and a sorry, five minutes. Go ahead, Jay. 
Is it manual? You can talk, ask. You can unmute manual. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Good. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Nice presentation. Uh, I'd like to uh, pin you on on the social on the on the government structure. Actually, I'd like for you to elaborate on this. You indicated that uh, this colony would be a special autonomous region of the United States. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile this this structure with the Outer Space Treaty, to which the United States is part of, as well as another hundred plus nations that prohibits nation states from holding property rights in celestial bodies. Specifically, that um, outer space, including the moon and other bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. Um, how, how would you respond to that? Um, so should I, should I take this one? Um, so my standard claim with this, um, along with a lot of the other treaties, is that these treaties were developed in a time well before anyone honestly thought that there would be colonies on the moon or on Mars, um, and were developed somewhat uh, prematurely. And so they will require refinement as, for example, um, the development of a uh, lunar base, there's the development of a Martian base actually becomes practical, then countries are going to start to care a lot more as to what those actual terms are. And you'll see the terms change into something that is going to be uh, more economically and politically viable overall. Um, so yeah, that's a, essentially my take. Thanks. Anosis? Hey, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, what will be the provisions for any faith practices uh, and their mutual respect and cooperation? Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, the practicing of, of faiths and the like, um, that would be governed uh, as it is in, in the United States with the, the standard uh, levels of religious freedom. Um, so people would be free to practice their faith as, as they see fit. Um, and in terms of uh, mutual cooperation, all the rest, um, that was where we were coming through in terms of the social cohesion aspects. So p the, the point of the social cohesion and then later on with the, the nudges is to go and foster an, an, at an atmosphere of mutual respect so that people can live in um, what, is, what is essentially reasonably close quarters for extended periods of time. I hope well, that answers the question. Um, my question, you were cut off, so to the final speaker, give us the one-minute version of your aesthetic concept. <laughs> the one-minute version of the aesthetic concept. Um, I would say that uh, overall we want to have a balance between um, having different domes represent uh, what their functional uh, form is to give a bit of a diversity to the space. But ultimately, the biggest thing about the aesthetic is about uh, really encouraging uh, open uh, areas to kind of tie back to even the previous question where we're talking about social cohesion. We had this concept of green and blue space. So, for example, in parks, you would have gardens and flowers and uh, that are offset against transparent plastic panels that um, encase the dome so you can look through into the ice with this kind of vibrant... Um, water kind of ice and water that offsets it. So we would say that it's really a beautiful city overall. And sometimes when we conceptualize the future, we like to say that we're looking forward to go to Mars because often, you know, we've got this stigma of this barren land, but I really think that the overarching architecture um, really fosters a very vibrant, very diverse and a very beautiful uh, place. Time is up.